D is for diversity. And so we are on to D of the alphabet series. And though my posts are usually helped along by a little bit of D is for drinking, I'm doing this one stone cold sober. And I'm choosing a different D word. There are so many delightful D words to choose from. To name a handful, D is for disease, dick, and all the fun words you can make with it. D programming, double standard, delusion, domination, Degradation, danger, death penalty, doormat, double D's, damsel in distress, death, and more. But no, I'm choosing one that, if I had a shit list for overused and obnoxious words from the year 2020, diversity would be on it, <clears throat> and near the top. And at the rate things are going, it'll be on my 2021 shit list as well. Oh hell, who am I kidding? I do have a word shit list. It's on my About This Site page that I wrote back in 2015 when I started this blog, and which I've been updating over the years as I find yet more people I have no desire to interact with. There, you'll find a word or phrase shit list under reason number two why I don't allow comments on this blog, made up of liberal homo goober speak, and my D word has been on the list for a few years now. D is for diversity. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I think diversity is a bad thing, not at all. But, like with most things, I embrace the natural and abhor the forced. Natural diversity is an awesome thing, and I'll spend a little time talking about that. Then I'll get to the problematic shit, the forced and unnatural, intentional and unintentional diversity. If you've read anything from my sexuality series, you'll know that I believe that the human male, in his need to control and destroy in the name of love, creativity, and curiosity, but which is really arrogance, ignorance, selfishness, sadism, and a quest for power at all cost, has ended up forcing a lot of unnatural conditions. Diversity is only one of these situations. So let's get to it, and in the name of flowers and sunshine and happy stuff, let's talk about the positives first. Natural diversity. During the second half of 2019, while, it was, while I was embarking on the risky adventure of leaving employment in China for unemployment in not China, I found myself enrolled in a community college bachelor transfer program in the U.S., I'm not going to get into that whole bizarro experience in this post, but looking at it now, a year after the school thing fell apart due to the pandemic, I regret choosing the U.S. over France, which was the other option I'd had at the time. But there were glimmers of excellence. There always are, even in the shittiest of circumstances. One of these glimmers was the fall semester I spent in an ecology course. I'll admit that I only took the class because I was forced to take electives and don't get me started on one-size-fits-all models of education. But luckily the instructor was stellar and loved her subject area, and ecology at least was related to my major. It's actually a subject everyone should study, at least online and for free, and I highly recommend Coursera for free courses in many different subject areas. And while there, do a quick search on ecology to see what they have going on. One of the key concepts in ecology and related disciplines is biodiversity, which basically means variety of life or species. Biodiversity is the hallmark of a healthy ecosystem, meaning the greater the number of variety of species naturally cohabiting a region, the healthier the area, ecologically speaking. Greater biodiversity equals better adaptation to threats, for example, human fuckery, natural disasters, etc. There are several well-known and mostly poorly conserved biodiversity hotspots around the world. And um, I'm including a map, and you can see a better version of it on my website, which I'll link to below. And that shows unique and or rich biodiversity zones around the world. It's from the World Wildlife Fund. The key thing to remember is that when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about the natural. Things grow where conditions are optimal for their biology, and nature has her way of keeping populations in check. The forager food, predator prey food chain is one of these common systems of balance keeping. Adaptation is another effective system. 
change to accommodate things happening in the environment, or die out. And these natural balancing mechanisms work really well except for with one species. And I'll give you a billion imaginary dollars, or golden feminist turds if you prefer, if you can guess which one. Which brings me to the less pleasant to contemplate portion of this post. Unnatural and forced diversity, male greed, ignorance, and hubris. It is natural and biological for human males to brutalize and destroy. They do it in the name of creativity, problem solving, exploration, and they even try to explain it away as survival. Very few call it what it really is, the quest for power and control. So, building on this, let's say you have a beautifully functioning system. I'm talking about natural biosystems primarily, but you can apply this to any system you can imagine. Then you introduce human males into the system. In less time than it takes to say hot mess of the scrotal variety, you'll find a massive dick-shaped wrench thrown into what was originally a well-oiled machine. And while some systems, biological ones especially, will work things out over time, if left alone, they never get the chance to do so for two reasons. First, it is written into male DNA to mess with things, even if told not to, in no uncertain terms. They fiddle, they diddle, they poke, they prod, they take and they kill, and then they shrug it all off. And while utterly self-congratulatory about this fiddling, diddling, poking, prodding, taking and killing, they never actually make things better. And second, males are always trying to deny their obsolescence. In other words, instead of making things better for the majority, they deliberately create problems so that they have something to fix or overcome. If there are no problems to apply their manliness to, then why the hell do they exist? Males dictated long ago the purpose of woman, to breed and service men. And most women are too afraid and brainwashed to question this man-made cage. But males have never really answered their own existential question. And this is why every single one of them wrestles with this topic over the span of his life. And we all know what happens when males lack purpose and develop angst. They get really insecure and emotional and take it out on women, on women and the planet in the worst way they can manage. Sometimes this destruction becomes a purpose. After all, for some, even God has a violent plan, right? So let's dig deeper and look at the intentional and unintentional unnatural diversity next. And then we'll finish by addressing forced diversity and its evil twin, inclusivity. But I'll also address forced lack of diversity or forced uniformity. This won't be comprehensive, but I'll provide examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. Likely, people will become offended for one reason or another, even though I'm just outlining observable phenomena and sometimes the personal experiences of myself and others. Try to hang in till the end. 1A. Unintentional, unnatural diversity. One of the best ways to illustrate this type of unnatural diversity is through the idea of invasive species. And despite not intending to cause problems, humans, most often men, are usually the reason it happens. Increased global travel over the centuries, and especially in the last century, has meant that travel vessels as well as import-export goods and shipping containers have been exposed to plants, sea creatures, insects, and animals in one place, and then have moved on to another place. Plants, critters and their offspring, and the various diseases and microorganisms that depend on these larger beings can catch a ride and suddenly find themselves in a new ecosystem. Organisms that manage to survive the voyage and then find themselves undiscovered, released into the wild, and without any natural predators to hunt them down, can easily begin to take over the local flora and fauna. Ironically, an invasive species, while initially increasing biodiversity, technically, usually ends up causing a lack of diversity, and in some cases, serious ecosystem destruction. On the human diversity side of things, I'd argue very strongly that complete denial about how racist, sexist, religious men operate coupled with lax border control and weak liberal politics over the last few decades in Western Europe, 
have led to a massive influx of aggressive but oppressed Muslim male migrants and refugees of various ethnicities. This tidal wave has resulted in a diversity situation with unintended semi-invasive species consequences. And note here that it is not women who are the problem. The majority of refugees are female, as women are always the majority of victims of war, and they must be supported, although I'd prefer only to allow their daughters to accompany them, not sons for obvious reasons. Males, on the other hand, regardless of whether they are migrants or refugees, are always problematic and bring their local brand of misogyny and violence with them to countries that welcome them and support them and allow them to practice their woman-hating religions freely. One of the major problems is that young single males visit a heap of sexual assault on local and tourist women, and likely out of fear of being labeled Islamophobes, no one does anything about it. It's only women being assaulted after all, not humans. One prime example was the rash of sexual assaults of white women on New Year's Eve in 2015, including a volunteer policewoman by gangs of Arab males in Cologne, Hamburg, and Frankfurt, Germany. Videos taken by locals of the events were pulled off of YouTube within hours of upload, and mainstream news delayed reporting on what amounted to about 120 reported sexual assaults, including one confirmed rape. Who knows how many actual assaults occurred? The speed at which white women are deemed racist these days when they report sexual assault by men outside their race defies logic. To add insult to literal injury, the mayor of Cologne, a woman, even laid the blame on German women and instead of deporting the offenders, suggested that women keep strangers at arm's length. The implication was that they were behaving like standard Western white sluts deserving of rape instead of like proper Muslim women who should be helped and pitied. I myself have been physically and sexually assaulted by Arab and sometimes black males in every single European country I've been to except Czechia and Greece and on all but one trip I've made to Europe since 1996. Belgium, Germany, and France have been the worst by far I wrote about a violent gang assault I experienced in Belgium when I was 24, the first time I'd ever been strangled, where I thought I was going to die. So to me and other white females I've talked to, and who, by the way, like me, have never reported their assaults, because what's the point? Invasive species is an apt analogy. When illegal and non-citizen males are given free reign to assault the local or a targeted race of women, the victims have no power to fight back. And when there is no one predating on or exerting control over the interlopers, you have a near definition of an invasive species. It may not have been intended, but the unnatural and unplanned diversity is highly problematic to females, not males, who ironically tend to be the most vocal in opposing liberal policy on immigration. Women, stupidly and just like they've been trained to do, welcome diverse expressions of misogyny with open arms and then are shocked when something inevitably happens to them. Why isn't female safety a human right? Well, we all know the answer to that one. Only penis is human, even a raping penis. 1B, intentional, unnatural diversity. There are times when men deliberately introduce species into foreign environments to serve selfish human purposes or to add variety to local options, and the results are unpredictable, but usually a problem. Other times, a desirable species from another place is brought in for labor or human comfort, as we see with many domesticated pets and farm animals. There are often problems with deliberately introduced species catering to human selfishness. I'll address food crops and leave the pets and domesticated animals for now. Let's explore. When human males started exploring the world hundreds of years ago, they began to bring back the exotic to their homelands. New foods and spices, plants, animals made their way into local taste and customs, providing an unheard of variety of flavors and experiences. This is part of every culture. All cultures have things they use that originated elsewhere but that may have become traditional after years of assimilation. 
a funny example from China, and I use China because I know more about their culture and their silliness than other foreign cultures, and they also get very superior and snobby when it comes to their culture. Food is an especially annoying area of snobbery. But did you know that the crucial ingredient to the important Sichuan and Hunanese cuisines, the hot pepper, isn't native to China? Indeed, it is not. The Chinese have the Spanish and Portuguese of the 15th century to thank for introducing oral firepower, originally from the Americas, to their precious traditional food. Likewise, with the regularly consumed peanuts and corn, Did you know that you can get corn on the cob at McDonald's in China? It has been reasoned by Russian plant thinkers and researchers that the place with the greatest diversity in food crops indicates their origin. For example, you'll find more varieties of chili pepper in Central and South America than anywhere else because that is where they are originally from. Logically, as crops move to foreign lands, local peoples will select the varieties that taste and grow best thus immediately increasing diversity in their diet while decreasing diversity in plant genetics over time. And today, all around the world, we are seeing much less crop diversity, even in places where plants are native. Due to human meddling in genetics, industrialized farming, and the the loss of local small-scale farmers who traditionally planted very local varieties, this doesn't bode well for the food system at all, And yes, if you trace this problem back to its roots, it is because of male dominance, female slavery, the resultant overpopulation problem, and male expansionist tendencies for appropriating resources from other lands and increasing their economic power. It always comes down to something along those lines if you're willing to examine modern problems honestly and in depth. And I'm including a food origin map. Um, If you can't see it here, then definitely go to the original article to see it. 2A. Forced diversity and inclusion. Ring-a-ding-ding. As you may have guessed, this subtopic is the one I'm most interested in from a political standpoint. It stains the entire political landscape in the modern Western world, and it represents a world of illogic, unfairness, sexism, racism, double-think, and censorship, all wrapped up in a faux moral superiority virtual signaling shit sandwich. And it is, in short, one of the major accomplishments of modern male supremacists dressed up as anti-racism warriors. All across North America, and possibly even extending into Western Europe, you'll find signage with slogans telling the world how wonderful forced diversity is and its nasty nasty sibling inclusivity are. But when you're, forced, when you're forcing something to happen that isn't natural, it ends up being kind of fake and giving privileges to some while trampling the rights of others. I'm not talking here about making white males mad because they don't get all the available promotions through nepotism and the old boys network anymore. White male supremacy is forced exclusivity, and it is thus unnatural. I'm also not talking about making sure the subpopulations that are already present are represented in their communities. Organizations need to reflect the communities in which they operate. That is natural diversity and a matter of fairness. What I'm referring to is deliberately hurting people for characteristics that they just can't change, such as race and sex, enforcing diversity where little to none may exist to begin with. Just as we don't look down upon parts of the world where plant species aren't as diverse, we should not do so with less naturally diverse human societies as well. And just as shipping a bunch of tropical plants to the tundra, which isn't going to achieve anything, forcing diversity has no objective value or purpose, which is to say that political agendas don't necessarily have much value or meaning outside of winning popularity contests. The basic premises of liberal Western diversity measures are that A. All white people are evil and racist and should be blamed for everything wrong in the life of a person who is not white. B. A city or region or group that is unintentionally predominantly white must be injected with people who are not white. Otherwise, it is not diverse has no cultural value and is therefore evil. C. Females are no longer permitted to call themselves women to the exclusion of non-females and must allow their boundaries and privacy to be invaded and colonized by males. 
Not to do so is anti-diversity and literally akin to murder. And D. Straight, bi, or queer are okay. Gay or lesbian are not. If you have to be homosexual, then you must still fuck people of the opposite sex, even if you have to pretend they are the same sex, because not to do so is not inclusive. Besides, what is biological sex anyways? Biology is not a science, but rather a state of mind. Yes, a feeling. And stating facts is discriminatory and anti-diversity. So male is female is male is... Wait, what? Well, you know what I mean. The Force Diversity Gang, and it is a gang, runs on all sorts of bizarre anti-science, anti-evidence, anti-logic, catchy sound bites that are designed to rally approval seekers and to prevent women from talking about interracial oppression and crime, and preventing lesbians and other women from talking about having their rights as women taken away by men pretending to be women. I see the words diversity and inclusivity, a word meant to paint opponents as racist, anti-male, or anti-trans, and to silence them everywhere I go. On front lawns of private homes, on websites, in storefront windows, and on public school billboards. It is creepy, like the communist propaganda posters you still see in China. You're likely familiar of some of the following. Happy World Cultural Diversity Day, May 21st. Me? Never heard of this day. I think it's only celebrated in the minds of liberal Americans. No one else pretends to give a shit. The In Our America poster. About half the contents of this poster aren't actually what these people believe, but the message is clear. Welcome to America, the home of liberalism, lies, and love. Like the religious right, they will love you as long as you don't question them. The Sexual Diversity Rights Movement in Symbols I know the first two, and the rest are just, what the fuck? There is way too much going on in Gen Y and Gen Z's heads. Yet, so little of use. What a waste. Forced diversity means that women still aren't getting ahead. Women are more than half the population everywhere, except where they are deliberately killed off by men and their handmaidens, and yet they aren't included in this political push for diversity. They are still pushed aside so that males can take jobs, awards, and recognition. It is more important to change the natural composition of a local society for no logical reason other than racial guilt than to ensure natural diversity is upheld, including women, for example. Hint, there is no guilt over misogyny since women will still fuck men regardless. No reparations are necessary. So this means that white women pay the price economically, legally, and socially for what white men have done in the past while the white men remain untouched and highly employable. It might not be such a big deal to a straight white woman married to a safely employed and highly paid white male, but single white women get thrown under the bus in a number of ways, including being excluded in diversity mandates. And of those added to the mix, they tend to be male as well. Like I wrote in a past post, While looking at a PhD program at a university in a region of Canada that happened to be predominantly white, I looked hard at the composition of the department. I've had plenty of experience in departments where I'm not represented and felt way too old to go through that shit again. I noticed noticed that the department had no full-time female faculty, despite the field not being particularly male-dominant normally but they had plenty of foreign males of other races and ethnicities, as well as the requisite stable of white males. I noticed that the university patted themselves on the back for upholding diversity, but if they truly embraced diversity, that department should have been half female. Forced diversity hurts women, and I've never seen an affirmative action program fix anything. 2B Forced homogeneity, uniformity, and exclusion. Let's finish off with the opposite of forced diversity. You know the words pest and weed? Well, these are relative terms. In reality, all species of plant and animal has an equal right to go about its business on the planet, and all have a place and purpose, no matter how small. 
It is only when humans decide that they are more important than all other living things that different species are valued or devalued. Some problematic species are easily managed through hunting or trapping, as in large game that venture into urban areas and kill innocent children, livestock, or house pets. Usually the problem isn't the wild species. It is the fact that humans have taken its living space and it is hungry with limited access to food sources. Very quickly, species can become endangered if fear of them is high or if their bodies, body parts, or body coverings have value. But sometimes species are hard to manage solely through these means. One brilliant idea, especially with small critters, evasive critters, or critters living in large areas, is to introduce what humans consider to be a natural predator. Usually it isn't local, and the idea is that it will serve the intended purpose eliminating or just managing unwanted or dangerous species, and then either just die once the food source is gone, or just blend in and chill. But that seldom happens. Very quickly, the target pest can become endangered, and you may even find out exactly what important role they played in their ecosystem. You also may suddenly find that the introduced species, which has no local predator itself, becomes an invasive species. On the solely human side of things, we've seen many examples of this throughout time in the form of ethnic, sexual, and religious genocide. Men of all ethnicities have sought to eliminate other ethnic and religious groups, especially women and girls. It isn't new, and it certainly wasn't a white invention, despite what people are saying these days. It, but it was, and is, very male. Very, very male. Personally, I don't understand the drive to have everyone look like you or to relegate a group to a subclass. These days, race and ethnicity issues are probably more of a problem in countries that are fairly monoracial and nearly to totally immigration prohibitive than they are in most Western countries. But they are front and center in the West, despite the fact that the true need, the one that is being sadly neglected, is women's progress. There seems to be a recent drive to erase women completely as natural beings, a sexual genocide of sorts. Pornification is a form of genocide, I believe. One thing to remember, there is no natural predator for the males in control, and unless they are males in the prey group, there is no hope for fighting back in a way that will work. Conclusion. Natural diversity, good. Forced diversity, bad. Male meddling, fiddling, and diddling always backfire. I truly suspect that we wouldn't see any of the, these issues if men didn't exist. And if humans didn't exist, well, check out the documentary Life After People to think about the idea that we wouldn't be missed at all.